So now let's look at sunlights, which are a little bit different. Instead of using cube map shadows, they're using cascade shadows. Here I can set the strength to the same strength that we set in cycles, which was about a thousand. And then we can go over to our exposure and turn this down again. But of course, since this is the only light in the scene, it's not really that important. So unlike point and area lights and spotlights, which cast cube map shadows, sunlights cast cascade shadows. And you can set the resolution here under shadows in the render properties. So similarly, if you set this to a really low value, you'll get extremely blocky shadows. And if you set this to something very high, you'll get nice and crisp shadows. But this works pretty differently than the cube map shadows because it's actually view dependent and how crisp your shadows are depend on how zoomed in you are. And this helps to really optimize things for very large scenes. So let's go back and I'm going to set this to be a little bit lower to 1024, which I believe is the default. And then we can go over to our light properties and let's look at the settings under cascaded shadow map. I'll turn off contact shadows for now. And first let's look at the count. If we set this to one, then no matter where we are in our scene, whether we're extremely zoomed out or we're super close, uh, it's always going to look exactly the same. It's just a very blocky shadow. Now, if we set this to two, then we're actually going to get a more detailed shadow when we're zoomed in close than when we zoom out. You can see at some point, this distance here, as I switch between the two, here we're getting the more detailed shadows, and then here we're getting the less detailed shadows. So the cascaded shadow map distributes the resolution of the shadows depending on how close you are to the object. So it's a really nice optimization. And if you set this to the default, which is four, you'll probably not notice too much as you zoom out. You know, when you're really this far out, you don't need extremely high resolution shadows. And so that works pretty well. There are a couple options here. Number one is fade, which is how much it fades as it transitions between the two. So if you set this to zero, it's just going to be a straight transition. And if you set this to a pretty high value here, then you can see that they kind of blend before they, they switch. But the default of 0.1 is usually pretty good. There's also a max distance. So if we set this to something fairly low, like 50, then when we zoom out, you know, we're not going to get any shadows whatsoever. And again, this is just a performance thing to help speed things up when we don't actually need them. So in this scene, you know, we probably want the default of uh, 200. That seems to work pretty well. But you can set this to be the maximum that your camera needs to actually see in the scene. So if your camera is only going to be seeing from, you know, from here to the other side of the room, then you can set this to be pretty low. Then you can see that the resolution of our shadows is going to switch in, you know, smaller increments. I'll set that back to about 100. And lastly, the distribution is just how close the camera needs to be in order to get that highest resolution. So usually I don't need to mess with this, um, but if we set this to something very low, then it's going to switch more when we're farther out. And if we set this to be very high, uh, then more of the switches are going to happen as we're up close. Lastly, the contact shadows here work exactly the same as with point, spot, and area lights, so that's nice. You might notice that on the side of our wall here, we're getting some really jagged shadows. And again, that's just kind of an inherent flaw in the way that rasterized shadows work. So with all of this super fast speed comes some of these downsides. Now, the way to get rid of that is either to introduce soft shadows and kind of randomize where those little jagged edges are placed and after enough samples, they kind of disappear, or you can rotate the light so that it's not at quite an extreme angle and they'll also go away that way. The last two settings that I did not cover here are the high bit depth, and this is not going to make any difference in your scene in the 3D viewport, but if you're rendering out to a high bit depth like a 32-bit EXR or something like that, if you want to really color correct your shadows and really fine detail, but for now I wouldn't worry about that. I wasn't sure at first what the light threshold value does, but that's because I was using a sun lamp and it doesn't really apply to that. The light threshold is essentially the same thing as the custom distance here, except it's for all lights and automatically calculated. So if you have custom distance here, then it's also not going to have any effect. But if you have this off and it's being calculated automatically based on the power, then what you can do is adjust the light threshold and all of the lights will similarly get cut off after a certain distance. And again, this really helps improve performance because if you have a ton of lights spreading over a really large area, then it just eats up too much memory.
But I think that covers everything when it comes to Shadows and Eevee. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask below this lesson. I know it's a lot of things to balance and tweak, and it's definitely not as easy as just throwing a light into cycles. But once you get used to it, these settings will become pretty intuitive, and you'll be able to light scenes pretty quickly.